Well, that was good. Look, I do know um, Dr. Sama and, and Miss Connie, and they are phenomenal. Uh, and I just want to say, uh, Amanda mentioned Jason and Leah, and I realize that there may be some folks here that have come so recently that they may not know who Pastor Jason and Leah are. And uh, they are actually, uh, they were here on staff for quite some time, and um, they are, um, Leah is the daughter of my grandmother, so she's my aunt, uh, Mima Esther, her dad is uh, W.S. McMasters that we had talked about, that dad mentioned earlier, and her husband, Jason, they now pastor in Homosassa Springs, Florida. And so Jason was actually our missions pastor. So if you didn't know who Leah and Jason was, that's who she's referring to. So they're, they're missionaries at heart, and now they're pastoring a church. And what I think is cool is they took the DNA of Leah's father and that mission's heart, and they went, and they're, they're doing that, this thing over in Florida now. So the kingdom expands. Amen. And, uh, and listen, if, if you are, are, are if, if you're not accustomed to Revival Temple and how we do things, what we do and how we do it is because we do what we do for missions. And Reinhard Bonnke had a famous saying that he always said throughout his books and his writings and even his sermons, is he said that he learned to plan with what was in God's pocket and not with what was in his so when we start throwing around numbers like 12,000, 15,000, I'm just going to say this unapologetically, that the average person looks at that and says, man, that's a whole lot of money. And, and, and you know, one of the biggest things when you ask people what turns them off about churches or preachers, they say they're always asking for money. Well, listen, I'm going to just say it like this. I don't think it's asking for money. I think it's giving opportunity to, to actually bless yourself, because this is what I have experienced. I'm 38 years old, and you can't argue with results. That's just the way it is. You cannot outgive God. I have never given to support and to further the kingdom that God has not given it back. But he don't just give you what you gave. He always gives you more. So please don't think that Revival Temple is, if you've come just in the last couple of weeks, this is actually Missions Month, and this is one of the only times you'll ever hear us even talk about giving to this nature. Y'all notice we don't pass place. Revival Temple, we don't even do fundraisers. We've talked about that before. We always want to be in the position of giving back to the community and to the world. So if you want to test God, just go ahead and give to his cause. I'm going to talk about that, not just giving, but just his cause in just a little bit. But I want to jump right into the word. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn them to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. This whole theme of the month is about, about praying, giving, or going. And uh, it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what, what uh, your occupation is. It doesn't matter what stage of life you are in. There is absolutely, and I mean this, there is absolutely no excuse for not taking part in the Great Commission in some way or another. Matthew 28, I'm going to start in verse 16. They're going to put it up on the screen for you. I want to read this. This is the words of Jesus. This is what he says. My verse, verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now that's an accurate picture of, of, of just church, of the world. Some worshipped and some doubted. We have that right now in this building. Now, I know that ain't you. Look at your neighbor and say, no, that ain't me. But there's, this morning, there are some that came and worshiped, and there are some that stood and doubted. That's just the reality of it. Now, if the shoe fits, lace it up and wear it, baby. I can't help if the shoe fits you. But you're going to find yourself on one or the other on that. Some worship, some doubt it. It says, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's important. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And verse 20 says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we call this the Great Commission passage. If you break that word down, commission, it is simply co-mission. In other words, this is a twofold thing. Jesus completed his mission, but he's still on it. 
But he has called us in to take part into his mission. So we are on a co-mission with him. So if you decide that you're going to be an obedient Christian and you take part in this great commission, it's not an option. It's a commission. It's a commandment. If you decide that you're going to take part in this, one thing that you have to understand and that is a steadfast fact is that you will never be alone in this, ever. That's why he says it's a commission. In other words, hey, you and I are going to do this together. If you are taking up the cause of the gospel, I can guarantee you this one thing that he says, I've never seen, David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Jesus will never forsake you in his mission. That's how passionate he is about it. If you, it doesn't matter, y'all, it doesn't matter if you decide to go into Walmart. It doesn't matter if you decide to go into another nation. If you're going to share the gospel, he said, I'm going to be with you. Lo, I will be with you always. So that settles the fact that if you go to step, if you feel God is calling you out somewhere, He's calling you out of the boat, walk on the water. If you feel he's calling you to a nation, if you feel he's calling you to a job site, if you feel he's calling you to a family, first thing you got to understand is that you will not walk there by yourself. Now, you may not know that he's with you until you actually take that step over into the unknown, but I can promise you that when you step through that threshold of faith, he will have already been there waiting on you with exactly what you need in the moment in which you need. It. I've watched him do it with healing. I've watched him do it with salvation. I've watched him do it with his anointing. I've watched him do it in finances. Let me give you an example. Let me give you a story. And, and if dad was going to mention this at some point through, he probably wasn't because that's just his way. But there was a year about two or three years ago that God laid it upon his heart to give a certain dollar amount to every ministry that was going to come to our missions conference. Now, I want to tell you something. When God speaks to you something prior, see, God, God, it, what, what's Hebrews eleven six 6 say? Without faith, it's impossible. He didn't say it might. He said, that's a strong word. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So a lot of times when he tells you to do something, you don't see the way he's going to do it until you actually commit and do it. And the Holy Spirit had spoke to Dad to give a certain dollar amount to every missionary that stepped foot in this door. And that dollar amount was $2,000. And that year, 75 ministries signed up to come to the conference. Now, you do the math. $150,000 that was going to go to these missionaries just so they could get here and just so they could have a way to function. It come down time to, it come time to write the checks. And I don't remember if it was mom or somebody come to dad and they said, Pastor, we only have this much in the account. And you know it was 75, it was half. It was $75,000 that was in the missions account. And I want to I just clue you in on the leadership. And this is your pastor's heart, but this is what he was taught by his pastor, by his spiritual father. He was taught to operate like this. And I'm telling you, this is why Revival Temple continues to operate like this. Dad's comment was that, that's not my problem. God told me what to do. And he began to write those checks. So you, you're writing a check in a $75,000 deficit. There's plenty of people to give witness to this. You can ask that man there. He finishes writing all the checks, and all of a sudden somebody comes by and says, Pastor, do you have time to talk? And, and goes and lays a $75,000 check on his desk and says, do with it what you want. You can't make this stuff up, y'all. I figured that would get a little more, <laughs> a little more praise than that. Listen. This is not bragging on people. This is bragging on God. And I'm going to tell you something. It's easy for people to sit back and say, oh, well, that's easy for people that have money. Let me tell you something. A lot of times it comes from folks that you, ain't, you, you would never expect. 
I want to ask you something. Who did the Bible give more honor to for giving what they had? The widow that gave the little bit that she had. Listen, it doesn't matter. It's not about what you give. It's what you give it to. I'm not trying to make this message about giving because this message is actually going to be about going. But when you take up the commission of the Lord, he says, I'm going to be with you. And it doesn't matter where or why or how or when, he's going to be with you. He's going to be with you. He supports his cause. Go to uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Very familiar passage of scripture with evangelicals. Very familiar. If you got a church that's even a hint Pentecostal, then you have heard this scripture before. Acts chapter 8, and let's read it. This is what it says. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, I want to break down this passage. This is, this is what we want to talk about today, about the commission of Jesus. Our commission is to spread the news That the Son of God come, died for mankind to save their soul, and that he has provided healing, freedom, deliverance, and salvation for the entire world. That's our message. Our message is a light in the darkness. Our message is not complex, but it's powerful. Our message is simple. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but what? Shall have everlasting life. Y'all, that's not a complex message, but it's probably one of the least obeyed commandments in the Bible. Oh, I, I, listen, I understand. There's these messages when I write them out. There's, time, there's some times where I'll just go ahead and throw an amen on it myself because I know I ain't going to get many of them when I let it out. So I'll just I'll say, oh, hallelujah, amen, that's good, Daryl, go ahead. But you shall receive power. Power. I don't know anybody that doesn't like a little bit of power. Come on. In the morning, that's why I drink coffee. I need a little bit of power to take some steps every now and then. Y'all ever been in a power deficit where you just, I can't do it. Listen, he said, I will give you power. (laughs) <laughs> You'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and also Samaria. And let's break these three down, three, these three things down. Jerusalem, what is he speaking of? When he says Jerusalem, I believe that he means the, the closest thing to you. He's saying this in Jerusalem. So what he's saying, he's saying, first, the first place that you're going to be a witness to is in the places that you are right now. Let's break this down to our life. The first place that you are commissioned to take up the cause of the gospel is in your home. Daddies, you need to be speaking the word of God in your home. If you are not, you need to correct your doing and start doing it. Your kids need to be able to understand, to hear, to recognize, and the voice of God and the word of God should not be foreign in your home. I will unapologetically say that. Your kids should be able to instantly lean on the principles of the Holy Spirit, the principles of the Word of God. You should be putting a moral compass in their life at a young age called the Word of God. What's the Bible say? It says, you raise them up in the way that they should go, and when they are young, they shall not depart from it. Well, let me tell you something. That can go either ways. If you raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord and the reverence of God, guess what? When they're old, they're going to come back to that. But if you raise them up, and this is for everybody watching online or may watch this, or you may get this by earshot later. If you raise them up thinking that sports is more important than the house of God, well, then when they get to an adult, that's how they're going to translate that to their family. If you raise them up thinking that it's okay to put church on the back burner because the church is who we are it's just not where we go and you you raise them up not thinking that that the scripture forsake not the assembling together is not for a reason then don't be surprised when they treat church as an option that's your first mission is your home Don't even worry about preaching on your job if you're not living it in your home. 
I heard somebody say it like this. I don't care if you can pray in tongues if you mean in English. I don't care if you preach on your job if your wife can't stand you. I don't care if you can fall out on the ground if your husband knows that he can't spend time with you. If your kids are afraid to come to you. <laughs> your first mission is your home, moms and dads. That's your first place. I could keep going down that road, but I'm going to jump on to Judea. He said, next, go to Judea. That's your surrounding areas. Let's call that your job, your campus, your friends. The places that you go and interact, the marketplace. I don't live at Walmart, but I go there, right? I am not excluded from the commission while I am somewhere other than my home or I'm not in church. Because here, you see, see, here's the deal. We think that coming to church is fulfilling the commission. No, see, the thing about everybody at church is that they're at church. <laughs> it's, and the thing about everybody here is that they're already here. And if you're here, you're here because somebody invited you. How many of you, raise your hand, you're, you're here because somebody at some point in time invited you to Revival Temple? How many of you here? Okay. Cool. All right. If nobody invited you, how many of you are here because the Holy Spirit prompted you to come to Revival Temple? In other words, somebody told you to come here. You didn't just poof, magically teleport here and say, my goodness, I'm here. This is a nice seat I'm sitting in. That's not how it worked. You came here with a purpose, right? There's other people that they need to be in the house of God, and they're waiting to hear. So we're on a commission. He said, go to Judea. Go to the surrounding neighborhoods. This is what I get a kick out of is, is that, and, and, and listen, y'all, I'm preaching, at, I'm preaching back at myself. Please understand, I'm preaching back at myself. Is that we're quick to give to missions, but we're not quick to walk next door. <laughs> we're, we're quick to give. Do y'all know that I have found that some of the most benevolent, loving neighbors are not Christian? We, Lauren and I, when we first got married, we lived in a, a, a little neighborhood, a subdivision up Walker North, and they had a guy that lived across the street from me. His name was Boudreaux. That was his last name, but, you know, we're in Louisiana, so everybody just called him Boudreaux. And I didn't know his first name for quite some time, and, uh, but I just knew him as Boudreaux. Boudreaux cut almost every person. If you didn't have a lawnmower, Boudreaux was cutting your grass. I mean, I didn't know where he lived for the, about the first six months that I actually lived in the neighborhood because he was in a different yard cutting grass every time I would come in. And then I finally figured out that, okay, he, okay, he lives in that house. Boudreaux was cutting every, but you know what? Everybody loved Boudreaux. Yeah, everybody did. Man, if your grass, maybe he just liked his place to look good, so by making yours look good, then, you know, I don't know. Maybe that was his reason. But whatever reason, he was always cutting other people's grass. And I'm sitting there thinking, my goodness, man, if the, if, if, if the church could get that logic right there, you say, hold up, Pastor, I ain't about cutting nobody's grass. I ain't, listen, listen, love your neighbor as you love. I'm tell, that Jesus. That Jesus had some nerve to talk about some things, didn't he? So Judea. Oh, I'm going to have fun with this one. Samaria. Nobody really wants to go to Samaria. Jesus intentionally went there. But the Samaria, th those people were looked upon. They were marginalized because of the way they worshiped, the way they act, the way they, they lived. Nobody wanted to go and be a part of their people culture. I think what he's telling us in Samaria is you're going to have to go to the places that are inconvenient to reach. You're going to have to go. This is, this is y'all ready for this? Sit, let's cinch up our, our belts real quick. You're going to have to go to the people who aren't like you. You're going to have to tell Jesus or tell people about Jesus to people who aren't like you. Whether we like it or not, we project how we want people to be. But I want to tell you something. If everybody was like me, this would be a boring world. I'm going to throw that back on you. If everybody was like you, this would be a boring world. We need a little bit of diversity. 
And I think what he's saying is you got to go love the inconvenient. You got to love those who are not sure of themselves. You got to love those who nobody else is wanting to go to. You got to love some people who don't believe like you. Because the, the people in Samaria, they didn't necessarily believe like everybody else. But here in the United States, this is what we're guilty of. If they don't believe like us, then we're just going to write them off. Well, they're not Republican. By God, I ain't talking to them. Though he said, if they, even if they don't believe like you, have a conversation with them. Amen. Amen. A friend of mine posted something the other day. He said, you think Jesus would be Republican or Democrat? I said, well, you're just trying to start fights, aren't you? Because it don't matter what part of the country you can go to, somebody's going to answer that the wrong way. I was like, well, technically, if you want to look at it, I mean, he said, take everything you got, bring it to me, and I'll give it to the poor. So I was like, that leans more or less on socialism. <laughs> I was like, he goes, what? I was like, ah, dude, I just said that just to mess with you, dude. He's the purest form of, I said, I said, here's the problem. I said, and none of that fits. I said, because all of those things are voted on and all of those things are man-made democracies. I was like, the, uh, he, he, his only political structure is king and kingdom. That's it. We have to see that this commission does not come with stipulations, church. We do not get to exempt people, ideologies, thought patterns, regions, we don't get to exempt anything from saying, I'll do it. I'll go. So how dare we look at something and say, I'm going to leave that to somebody else, when he might just be looking at you and said, no, I've left that for you. I said it, I don't know, it was, uh, I think it was Wednesday night, I was, I, was taught, I was preaching in here, and I said that I get, a lot of, I, look, I get a lot of questions from young people who are first generation Christians in the youth group, and they often ask this question, if, I, if God's good, and this is, it was, I was talking about Gideon, it was, if God's good and, 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 and I'm saved, why is all this stuff happening in my family? Why is all this bad stuff happening to me? And I said, perhaps God called you and, and because he knew he needed somebody to be the change agent in your family history. Perhaps you need to change the question of, God, why is all this happening to me? And, God, why did you put me here? Show me the reason that you put me here. I said, because I believe some of you are sent to change your family lineage. It's like dad said before, I think there's some things that run in families until they run into you. But we don't get to exempt what and where and how we spread the gospel. We just have to do it. And then he said to the ends of the earth. Well, that's pretty easy. Getting to the ends of the earth has never been easier than it is in this day and age. You can get to the ends of the earth through technology. You can get to the ends of the earth by just getting on a plane or a jet and going across the pond. I've been to different parts of the earth. It's amazing. It would do every person in America good to see other parts of the nation, other parts of the nation, other parts of the world, and hear other languages spoken and realize that this world's pretty big. One thing that I find interesting is no matter how many countries I've been in, there's a couple things that are always familiar. One is the word hallelujah. It's always translated the same. Hallelujah. And the other is speaking in tongues. It always sounds the same. Always. It doesn't matter where you're at. I suppose that's because it's a heavenly language. So it all comes from the same place. That'll give you a little thought there, won't it? <laughs> but you know, going to other places, it opens your mind just how vast and diverse God is. So we need to take that in consideration when it's time to spread the gospel. When somebody comes in, we shouldn't say, oh, I'm going to spread the gospel. Nah, never mind. They look a little different than me. No, there's no exemptions on it. Y'all all right? So we have a commission. We have a commission that we're supposed to fulfill. Um, we're supposed to take up the cause alongside of Christ with this. So this is what we need to understand, that God will back his cause. He's benevolent. He says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If, you, if God speaks to you to give or to go, you don't have to worry. Now, this is the key, though. If God speaks to you, if God gives you the word, you don't have to worry how that's going to work out. He's going to work it out. 
It's like Gamaliel told Paul or Saul when, when he was persecuting. He said, I've seen people stand up before and it wasn't of God and it's, it was squashed. Nothing happened of it. But he told, speaking of Peter and John and the disciples, he said, if this is of God, you, do not, you cannot stand against it. But if it's not, then you won't have to. It's going to fall by the wayside anyway by itself. If you've got a word from God... I, I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter what you face. It doesn't matter what you come to. God is going to back his word. He's going to back his cause. So if God speaks to you to pray for somebody for healing, then that means the healing power of the stripes that were placed on Jesus' back is going to show up in the moment that you lay your hands on somebody and you say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. It's if we have faith to connect the two. Okay? Okay. So there's a whole lot of people. I heard just this morning, I was listening to Mike Bickle, and he was talking about some, some numbers. And he, he, he gave a number. He said it's estimated that there are 100 million evangelicals in, or people that claim to be evangelicals in the United States. How do they get that number? I don't know. But you got around 340-something million people. So roughly a third of the United States claims to be Christian. Key word. But yet, our nation is in the state that it is. How can that be? That we have such a strong declaration, but hardly no demonstration. If we would do more than we said, I have a feeling that a lot of the issues that we're facing right now would not be existent. I want to tell you something, and I will lay, th I'll, I'll lay this down at your feet because it's laid at mine as well. The climate politically that the United States is in is not because of which side got voted in. It's because the church took a back seat at some point and quit praying and making God the staple of this nation. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but I feel that the church going in the closet and everybody else coming out is why we are where we are at right now. And I think that if more church folk would go back into the closet, the prayer closet I'm speaking of, I believe that we would actually start to see the climate of this nation shifted. And you say, well, how can you say that? Because when you get power from the Holy Ghost, Brother Larry, that comes from time spent in prayer with God, the first thing, listen to me, church, that's going to change is your Jerusalem, those closest to you. Your kids are going to get on fire. Your kids are going to be overflowed. Then the second thing, I don't care who you are, if something's overflowing, everything around it is going to be affected and get wet too. Anybody pour too much Coke in a glass on the counter? What happens? The counter gets wet. So at first thing, you got to fill your cup. And then your cup gets so filled that it starts overflowing and it starts touching things in the surrounding areas. But guess what? If those things just keep bubbling up and keep flowing, all it does is continue to spread. So what I'm trying to tell you is that if you are endowed with power from the Holy Ghost and you have have an active demonstration of God's power in your life. I'm not going to have to look and wonder if you're demonstrating the gospel. I'm going to look and see the fruit of your labor. And if you take that, it's going to start in your home first. And listen, anybody ever worked with somebody that they brought the junk from their house into the workplace? How's that make you feel? What if enough Christians decided that I'm going to wake up early enough to get along with the Holy Ghost and I'm going to carry the fruit of the Spirit into my job? What if you begin to carry the fruit of the Spirit into your job enough times that it began to jump on and get on other people or at least cause them to ask the question, what is so different about you? Bam, the door is open. Can I tell you something? I've literally had people ask me, why am I smiling all the time? And that is an open open invitation to tell them about a person who dwells on the inside that I am no longer subject to everything on the outside, but I am controlled by something on the inside. And when you begin to affect your workplace or your campus, well, then that's, that, there's just no way that you can quantify the effect that would happen if revival broke out in your, in, your, in your place of work or revival broke out in your school. 
And you say, well, well, that's just easy to say. No, no, no. There are revivals that have been documented that have literally shut prisons and hospitals down. It's documented. It's not some fairy tale comic book. It's history. So I don't believe that God has weakened in his ability. And I don't believe that he's pulled back on his faithfulness. I believe that his body has stopped partnering with him in his commission. I believe that we have taken up our own cares rather than started walking and living for his cause. And the world is seeing the effects of the church sitting down. I've often asked myself, Moses, how did Moses tell 1.5, anywhere from 1.5 to 2 million people, that's what the historians say, that the nation of Israel was about the time that they left Egypt. Somewhere between a million and a half and 2 million people. Can you imagine being tasked by God to tell those people that I'm setting you free? You see, Moses is a type of Christ. It's not hard to see that, how the comparison. Jesus actually compares himself to Moses. He mentions him. Moses mentions Jesus. So he's a type and a shadow of Christ. And if you look at the stories, they parallel. We've got God's people who are bound up in a place called Egypt in bondage and captivity. They're, they maybe are bound in a place that they were never supposed to be that long. But they're stuck there and God sends a prophet to tell them they're free. But ask yourself, how did one man, actually two, Moses and Aaron, how did they tell almost two million people that they were free in the time span that they did? Just ponder this. At some point, I don't think that Moses went around to two, nearly 2 million people and said, hey, by the way, tomorrow we're leaving here. Tomorrow, pack your bags. It's time to go. In fact, that's why uh, Josh asked me what the, t what the title of this message is. I said, I said, call this message, it's time to go. Can you imagine being tasked with the the the... the the mission from God to, to tell two million people it's time to go. Let me tell you something. I don't believe he went to person to person to person to person. I believe he started in the different groups. I believe he started in households. But at some point, there had to be a thing called word of mouth that started spreading. Let me tell you something. The way the world is going to find out that a man has come to set them free and is here to deliver them is when we take it for, for real and serious and we start to tell everybody else wherever you go, hey, by the way, tomorrow we we're out of here. You say, what do, what do you mean, Daryl? This is what that means. If you show up somewhere and they're bound and you know that there has been a man sent, that he has already finished the work and been delivering them, then it's your job to tell them, hey, by the way, you don't have to be bound by this. You say, well, man, that's just getting all up in people's business. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. He got all up in people's business. He got all up in people's graveyards. He went to their homes. And you say, what do you mean go to their home? Yeah, he got talked about because he sat at the table with sinners in order to further his reputation there might come a day that you have to risk yours you might have to get accused of hanging around some questionable folks every now and then oh by god i can't do that i'm dignified i'm the chosen frozen i can't do that come on that's what religion will do to you it'll put you stagnant in your seat irrelevant to the kingdom but I pay my tithes. Well, congratulations. Well, I call upon the name of, the, uh, of Jesus. Yep, congratulations. What's the Bible say? Even the, even the demons know his name, but they at least tremble at it. And I ain't here to throw stones or bricks, but listen to me. I'm telling you, Jesus is about to get serious with those who are not taking up his mission. I believe, he's, I believe he's already dealing with churches that are not taking. Do you know that there have been churches that have shut down during COVID? This might be a strong statement. But I can't find anywhere in the Bible that supports his church shutting down because of an illness or a sickness. I can't find anywhere in the Bible that he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church except for a virus. Then that's going to shut it down. I can't find that anywhere. And I believe that he's getting ready to deal with idle churches that are doing nothing but meeting to settle their cares 
and doing nothing to further his cause. Household to household, person to person, I believe those Israelites began to tell each other, hey, hey, there's somebody here that says that he's setting us free. Do you know that people that are bound, they really are looking for freedom? They're looking for it. And in fact, the reason that they continue to get high or drunk is because during that time frame of influence that the chemicals have on their body, they're actually free from the conviction and from the thought and from the, the weights and the chains. But see, as soon as that comes down, they find themselves right back in that place of condemnation. And that's the thing that Jesus wants to break. He wants to get them in that place of euphoria and freedom without any consequences, shame, or guilt. He wants them to understand there is a freedom that you can walk in. People that are bound, y'all, they want to be free. And I'm going to tell you something. Right now, we are living in a day and an age that people are looking for the truth. They are lo- if you can't witness today, then you just can't witness. There had to be. There had to be conversations you know even Moses tried to get out of it but God I'm not an eloquent speaker don't worry about that I'm sending you kinfolk they're going to help you that tells me that it doesn't matter what you think you have or don't have when you take up his mission he's going to make sure you've got everything that you need to make it happen He's not going to leave you alone in this. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 8. I want to read Romans chapter 10, and verse 8. I'm going to read 8 through 17. Starting in verse 8, it says, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and who bring glad tidings of good things. Look at that. He says, how can they believe if they don't hear? How can they hear if nobody preaches? How can they preach if nobody's sent? This is what this church is alive to do. We're here to see whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We don't care if they're Mexican. We don't care if they're Latin American. We don't care if they're European. They're Chinese. They're Japanese. They're Indian. We don't care what tribe, nation, or tongue. All we care upon is about is that they call upon the name of the Lord. But the question remains, how can they believe if they've never heard? How can they hear unless somebody's preaching to them? And how can somebody preach unless they're sent? There's no excuse to not take part in the commission. If I can't go, I can send. You say, well, I'm not an eloquent speaker. That's okay. You might be an extravagant giver. Well, I'm not an extravagant giver. That's okay. You might be a fervent prayer. It all comes together, y'all. It all comes together. There's no insignificant role in pray, give, and go. Not everybody can go. But you can give in some way or form. 
It may not even be money. It, listen, it don't have to be money. You can give of your time. You can give of your resources. But everybody, everybody can pray. By God, you can open heaven for somebody. You can touch heaven for somebody. So there ain't no excuse to say, well, I'm on the outside of this mission. No, 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 no. This is a great commission. It's not the great option. It was not a multiple choice question. It was a co-mission. You're either obedient to it or you're disobedient to it. Amen, Daryl. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We can send them. We can pray for them. We can equip them. And listen, I'm just going to tell you something. It don't matter. <laughs> this church has gotten a reputation that when people need something, they call. And usually that something rhymes with honey. It's money. When a missionary calls, they typically, they need something. But let's just, let's just say what it is. Money makes the world go round, y'all. Money don't make everything great, but it sure makes a lot of things easy. Can I just say this? I just want to say this, that God ain't got no problem with money. The Bible says he's rich. He said he'll supply all my needs according to his riches. I'm just a kid with an allowance. God ain't poor. What glory does it give him when his kids are? What's that say about your daddy when you're poor and he's rich? That says you got a relationship problem. It says that you've been written out of the inheritance. That usually has something to do with your position or the lack thereof. That's a whole other message. But God ain't poor. When all these missionaries call and they say we need a van, y'all, they're not just trying to go on a trip to the mall or to the beach. They're trying to deliver medical supplies to orphans and to widows and to the hurting and to the poor. And they're trying to deliver the gospel. We don't look at it as we're buying a van. We look at it as that there's somebody that's going to call upon the name of the Lord and they're going to get saved. You can't look at it as money. In fact, that's when God will start giving it to you is when you quit looking at it money as money and you start looking at it as a tool. It ain't nothing but a resource to make things happen on this side of heaven. And let me tell you something, if you're stuck in the mentality to where I can't do this because I don't have the money, I, listen, if it's towards the kingdom, it ain't about how much money you got, it's about much, how much money he's got. I had somebody tell me the other day, man, I can't, I can't afford to pay tithes. Well, if that's your mentality, I can't do anything for you. You can't afford not to. You ain't got to take my word for it. Go read Malachi chapter 3. That's one of the few places that God says, hey, go ahead and test me in this. Yeah, test me. Let me see it. Te go, ahead and throw, go ahead and throw this out there. I could sit here and bore you with stories about how I've thrown uh, this much and somebody else has gave me this. That happens all the time. But listen, it's about people that are going to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, let me wrap this up. If somebody could come to the keyboard. Luke chapter 9, we see a story. And this is, this is interesting because Jesus, a lot of times, I, I think uh, I was having a conversation with Pastor Roger and Ms. Pam uh, earlier. And uh, we, we were, we're, Brother Roger and I were talking about putting ourselves in the context of the Bible stories. When, when something's happened in the Bible, actually putting ourselves, like I was talking about Gideon Wednesday night. Like, can you imagine actually being Gideon and watching 22,000 people walk off from you and then another 10,000? And God getting you down to 300 and said, okay, now you're good. I, I start, and I read this story, and we see in Luke chapter 9, and I'm going to start in verse 10, where Jesus is preaching and they come to this, this, this spot, and it says, the, the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then they took them, and they went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. When the multitudes knew it, they followed him, 
And he received them, and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who had need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, the twelve came to him and said to him, Jesus, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and the country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. In this moment, the disciples are automatically in their mind, they're ascribing their physical limitations to Jesus. We're in a deserted place. You need to send them to feed them. Look what Jesus tells them. He doesn't even explain this statement. He just looks at them and he says, you give them something to eat. So the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, feed them. And Jesus looks at them and says, no, you feed them. Look what the disciples say. And I don't know who brought this, but they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all these people, for there were about 5,000 men. Now, all they numbered this time and this age and this culture was the men. So, so here's the thing. It's not 5,000 that necessarily, it's, it's not just 5,000 that were being fed. It's more than that. It's, it's more. It's families. And he said, you give them something to eat. They said, we don't have it. All we have is, is five loaves and two fish. And then he says, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so. And they made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, here's the key. When you don't feel like you've got enough to do what he has called you to do, you automatically look up to heaven. Don't look out. Don't look down. Don't look around. You know, that's one of the first things that we do. When, when we have a need and we don't have what we need, to, we, ought to, we automatically start thinking in our mind. We all automatically start looking around as to who can bail us out and who can do this and what can we sell and what can we make happen. To, but really what he wants us to do is just look up. He says he looked up to heaven. I love this part of the scripture. He blessed it. He broke it. And then he gave it to the disciples to set before the multitude. And so they all ate. This, this what I'm about to say is the way that Revival Temple feels like we should operate. It says they all ate and they were filled. I'm going to stop right there for a second. God doesn't want to just give a ministry just enough to get by. He wants to give them more than they need. So when Revival Temple supports a ministry, y'all, we ain't trying to skimp. We ain't sending them leftovers. We ain't sending them what we don't want. We want to send them the best thing that we can send them because it's not God's intention to give you a taste and leave you with hunger pains when you leave his presence. He wants to leave you filled. He wants you to have more than enough. Look, and he says, so they all ate and they were filled in the 12, and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up. 12 baskets. I, I said not too long ago, God is a God of multiplication. If he tells you to do something, don't worry about what you have thinking it may not be enough. Just take what you have and bring it to him. I've heard people put it like this. If what's in your hand's not big enough to be your harvest, go ahead and plant it and make it your seed. And then you'll have a harvest big enough. But what God is saying is I'm not concerned with how little you have. All I'm concerned with is where you're going to bring it to. Because, see, that's the problem. A lot of us are still walking in lack because we have yet to take our little and bring it to him. Amen. Take what you've got and bring it to him. You say, I don't make that much money. That's all right. It's like this filter that it goes through. There's some people in this church that have got the concept that there is no end. I ain't worried about money. People ask me, there's, there's people that are way too worried about money. People ask me, one time, one time this guy, I pulled up in my old Chevelle, my old muscle car. He said, where'd you get the money to, build, to, to buy that? I said, I didn't buy it. I said, I built it. He goes, where'd you get the money to build that? I said, that's none of your business. I was joking. But I wasn't really. 
I said, I work. Well, don't you work at the church? I said, yeah, but I also work another job too. Yeah, two of them. And he said, well, how much is that church paying you? I said, no, that's none of your business. I was like, but I tell you what. I said, you bring your W-2, and I'll bring my W-2, and then I'll get my tithing report, and I'll bring your tithing report, and then we'll talk about it. Well, I ain't worried about that. I didn't figure you was. We make, we make this way too complicated. It's this simple, y'all. If God gives you a mission, go on it. If he gives you a cause, support it. If he gives you something to step out on, man, step out on it. He said, I won't leave you. I'll never forsake you. And God will back his cause up. Doesn't matter what he calls you to, he's going to bring you through. It doesn't matter what door he brings you to, he's got the key to unlock it. And you say, well, there's some things that are just closed off to me. I believe that's why he said, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. Because, see, there's some things that I believe God is going to call you to that man's going to try to keep you out of. But if you got the keys to the kingdom and you unlock that, it don't matter what man tries to shut on you. If God unlocks it, baby, it ain't staying locked. Has there anybody in here ever been in a place where man tried to keep you out of something, but God said, nah, I got this key. I don't care what they've done. They're operating in principle. I, I'm, I'm giving them this key right here. If you ain't ever experienced that, I'm going to invite you to push for that. If we take up God's cause, there's one other story that I want to reference, and then I'm, gonna op- I'm, gonna, I'm just going to open the altars and ask if anybody wants prayer. Also in the book of Luke, we see the story, and we, we see the story as a parable of the Good Samaritan. And I've heard this preached a lot of ways, and I've heard, I've heard uh, a lot of teachers and a lot of preachers, and you can identify yourself with, with just about every person in the story. Maybe you've been the person that's gotten beat down before, fell, fell amongst thieves, and, and you, you've, you've, you fell on hard times. But it says the priest come... And saw him and walked on the other side of the street. Boy, that's sad right there. That's sad right there. What was, what was Jesus saying then? He said that, yeah, I even got some people that say that, that they're, they're my servants, but they're going to walk on the, they're going to, they're going to look away from the need so they don't have to go meet it. And then it says the Levite. The Levite, that whole clan was supposed to be a people set apart for Jesus or for God. The Levite goes on the other side. And then it says, then there's the good Samaritan that comes along, and he picks him up, and he cleans him up, and he brings him to an inn. He brings him to the innkeeper, and he says, give him what he needs, clothe him, feed him, and take care of him. And he gives him money, and he says, anything extra that it costs for you to take care of him, he says, I will settle up with you in the end. This is the the perspective of this story I want to throw at you today. We're not, as the church, we're not the person getting beat down. We're not less than. We're not the priest. We're not the Levite. We're not even the good Samaritan. The church is called to be the innkeeper. Jesus has entrusted us with those that he brings to us and says, you take care of them. Whatever it costs you, you clothe them. Whatever it costs you, you make sure they're not hungry. Whatever it costs you, you take care of them. And whatever you cost, whatever you spend more than what I've given you right now, I'll settle up with you. I found that to be the reality in church. Y'all, we take care of the hungry. We take care of the needy. We'll take care of the widows. We'll take care of those that the Lord brings to this house. And it ain't up to us. There's a lot of money that goes out of this place. A whole lot. And sure, there's times that people take advantage of it. But we've had people come in and say, we're hungry. We're not going to let you leave here hungry. We ain't going to let you leave here cold. He said, I'll settle it. I'll take it. It doesn't matter what we're talking about, y'all. If you take up his calls... He's going to go there with you. Everybody's staying with me this morning. I'm getting ready to start wrapping this up, close this out. I want to I circle back around to one particular scripture that we use as the staple a lot of how we do church. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where he said, You shall receive power 
when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. I want to say something. In this day and age, I believe that there's going to have to be a differentiating factor amongst churches. I'm not saying that there ain't churches that aren't making a difference, that aren't quote-unquote Pentecostal. But what I'm telling you is that I believe as a believer to make a difference in this climate culture that we're living in, I believe that you need to have the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. I believe that you have to have a power to be witnesses in your home, on your job, and to the ends of the earth. I believe you need the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe the Holy Ghost is going to be the power. He's going to be the voice that leads and guides you. He's going to be the wisdom to give you answer in a time of need. He's going to be the power that backs you up when you lay your hands on somebody and you pray for him. He's going to be the continuing work of Jesus when he did what he did on the earth. He's going to continue that work in and through you when you've got somebody that's bound and say, I don't want to drink anymore. I don't want to smoke anymore. I don't want to do these drugs anymore. You're going to be able to lay hands on them and by the power of the Holy Spirit see them set free now you either believe that or you don't but Jesus said this these things and greater shall you do he said it for a reason he said it's to your advantage that I go away you need the Holy Spirit you need the power of the Holy Spirit to live and to take up his calls you need it I believe that God is getting ready to expose parts of his body that has relied on technology and planning and, and algorithms and this and that and research and this and economic, economic studies to, to where to plant churches. I believe that he's about to bring us back to a place to where we're going to have to hear the word, we're going to have to hear his voice, and we're going to have to walk out the Great Commission with the laying on of hands. Listen, the problem that I see in the story where Jesus said, no, you feed them, is there's too many Christians just coming to church on a Sunday and hand the people that are pastor and saying here you feed them I'm going to look back at you and say what Jesus said to the disciples no you go feed them you go feed them he's given you the measure of the Holy Spirit the same way he's given me the measure of the Holy Spirit you go feed them there's some places you go I don't have access to This pulpit and this mic and technology may, may give me the, the ability to reach people outside of these walls. But our ability to reach people outside of these walls <laughs> should not rely on technology. It should not rely on studies. It should not rely on tactics and strategies. And it should not rely on programs. It should rely on a, on a church body of people that will say to each other, hey, somebody has come to set us free. It's time to go tell everybody it's time to go. We're coming out of this. We're going out of this. So it's time, y'all, that we take up the commission. So this is what I want to ask you. Do you want to take up his cause? Because to take up his cause, you're going to have to put aside some of your cares. But if you want to take up his cause, you're going to need a power. And that power is the Holy Spirit. And if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit and you want to be or you want to, you want to, you want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, then I'm going to open this altar and say, well, come on down. It ain't my job to baptize you. It's his. Jesus is the baptizer. The Bible said that he'll baptize you in fire. Y'all know what fire does? It burns things. Some of you if, you, if you're looking to start a fire in your house, you need to come get lit right here. If you're looking to start a fire in your job, come on. I wasn't trying to say get lit in a cool way. I, I'm not trying to be cool. I'm not like literally before it became like a phrase, it like lighting something means you lit it. Now all the kids are like, it's lit. You know. Come on, thank you. Is there anybody that needs the power of the Holy Spirit to bring home with you, to go to your school, to go to your house, to go to your work? Come on, now's the time to do it. The Holy Spirit is willing to give liberally. He ain't going to hold back. 
Jesus is not going to hold back. In fact, it's why he embraced the cross. He said, it's to your advantage that I go away because I'm going to send you a helper. Come on. If you're looking for a higher power, if you just hadn't been able to get it done with your words or your emotion, now's the time to come down here right now and get you something that is more powerful than anything you've ever had. Is this it? Come on. I want y'all to lift your hands with me right now. Fill us up. Come on, I want you to begin to ask Jesus to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you speak in tongues, that's fine. I'm more interested in you being on fire than just hearing a prayer language. Come on, I want you to lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking for everyone right now, Lord, that is seeking this gift. Lord, I pray that you said, just like you said, I would baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. Lord, I'm asking you to baptize your church right now with fire. Lord, I pray that you would baptize them with the Holy Spirit right now as we speak. Lord, for those that are seeking, I pray that they would find, they would make that connection to you. But Holy Ghost, we pray right now for a baptizing and anointing upon your people and your church to carry out the commission of Jesus. Lord, we rely upon you to fill us right now. We rely upon you to fill us to an overflowing, to baptize us in the name of Jesus. Come on, if I got some prayer team that's filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to come and start praying with these right here. If you, if you, if you feel like you need more, if you feel like you're just barely getting by, I want to tell you something. This is the power that will get you more than just getting by. You need the power of the Holy Spirit, and I ain't shy to tell, tell you that. You need the power of the Holy Ghost in your life to live. You need the power of the Holy Ghost to thrive. So, Lord, we pray right now that you fill them, Lord. Fill them, Lord. Fill them, Lord. Baptize them. Come on, church. Continue to pray. I don't want you just to spectate. You said, we've been going for a little while. Y'all, we're talking about souls here. We're talking about souls here. Fill them with the Holy Ghost, Lord. Fill them to the, with, to the overflowing. Baptize us with fire, Lord. We ask right now, Holy Spirit, that you send your fire. Send your fire, Lord. Send your fire, Lord. Send your fire, Lord. Come on. Come on, y'all help me pray, church. Come on, church, help me pray just a little longer. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. How many of y'all need hope more of the Holy Spirit in your life? (laughs) 
if you, I, w- I want to encourage you something. We, we, a lot of times we pray for the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if you're like me. It took me a while. I know Dad's got a similar testimony. It took me a while before, if you're, if you're concentrating on like the prayer language, it took me a while before I broke through into that. But the thing that broke through was the diligence and the consistency. He said that if you s- diligently seek me, Listen, don't ever stop praying for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptize. I pray every morning, Holy Spirit, I pray that you baptize me today. You say, well, you've already been baptized. Man, just throw some more on me. (laughs) Just give me some more, Lord. Give me some more. Come on. Y'all, we're a Holy Ghost believing church. I know it doesn't make sense to, to everyone, and it's not always understood. But, y'all, I'm, I'm going to say something right now. If we're walking in the demonstration of the b- gospel, we ain't going to have to try to worry about the explanation of the Holy Spirit too much. A lot of times, demonstration takes the place of explanation. Would you just lift your hands with me right now? I want to pray for you as you leave out of here. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every household leader. I pray for every mom, every dad. I pray for every boss. I pray that you would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and fire. I pray that you would give them the power to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I pray that today we would make our minds up that we're going to take up your calls. We're even going to put aside some of our cares. But we're going to do what you've called us to do, Jesus. And I thank you that no matter where we go, or what you call us to do, I thank you that you're going to be right there with us. And we bless you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.